Welcome to Introduction to Project Management, Team Management and Communications. This is Lecture B. The objectives for team management and communications are to identify and describe roles of members on a project team, develop the human resources plan, acquire, develop, manage, and lead the project team, identify project communication responsibilities, develop a communication plan. This lecture will focus on the third objective. When planning, staffing, and managing your project, it is important to consider your single most important resource, people. There are various organizational theories that describe key factors that motivate people. The following are examples of such theories. According to the expectancy theory, people anticipate that they will receive positive reinforcement for their work. You can use the rewards to motivate your team members. The McGregory theory of X and Y posits two types of employees, type X and type Y. Type X employees need to be monitored and encouraged to complete tasks, while type Y employees are self-starters who will work without supervision. The Herzberg theory asserts that if basic employment needs, such as salary or a safe working environment, are not met, people will not want to perform the work. On the other hand, these elements do not motivate employees to work. Rather, people are driven by psychological aspects of employment, such as success, reward, and personal development. Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which is shown here on the slide as a pyramid, posits that motivation operates as a stepped process to meet employee needs. Once employees have one step or one need filled, they automatically progress to the next higher step or need. Employees are ultimately satisfied when they achieve the pinnacle of the pyramid, self-actualization. The steps of need run the following spectrum from bottom to top. Physiological needs, food, water, shelter, clothing. Safety needs, family security, protection. Social needs, belonging, friendship, love. Esteem needs, need to be a respected individual. Self-actualization, to feel complete and valid in all aspects of self, to feel confident in being oneself. These theories can be applied to understanding employee motivation and in selecting and building project teams. When managing a project team, it is important to understand the different types of authority that exist in a project team. The team dynamics will be greatly impacted by how power is asserted within the team. Referent power is individual power based on a high level of identification with admiration of, or respect for, the power holder. Formal power is based on rank or position. This type of power is where the project manager has been assigned by senior management to be in charge of the project. Technical power is based on strong technical skills in the project's domain. Coercive power is authority or power that is dependent on fear, suppression of free will, and or use of punishments or threats for its existence. This is in effect if the project team is afraid of the power the project manager holds. As a project manager, you can increase your power and influence by doing the following. Generate high levels of trust, worker satisfaction, and motivation. Communicate openly and effectively. Listen with empathy by demonstrating a desire to understand and creating a strong rapport with your colleagues. The acquire project team process involves the process of obtaining the specific people needed to accomplish all phases of the given project. Ideally, your team members bring specific qualifications and capabilities to the project team, although when workloads require, duplicity may be required. Often, the ultimate selection of a project team is made by the project management team. In addition to the goal of diversifying the team and acquiring team members that bring different assets to the team, a number of other factors should be considered when choosing the team members. Those factors include a series of enterprise environmental factors, such as work experience, availability, and cost, among others. Derivation of clear and concise project organizational charts, and formulation of a thorough staffing management plan. Once the team has been properly staffed, the next steps, or outputs, of the process involve staffing out assignments to the team. 
determining availability of resources, and updating your staffing management plan. Role requirements outline the type of staff the project needs. The project management team can use that as a basis for filling the project team with the personnel that is needed. In the selection and acquisition of the project team and all other project resources, negotiation is the number one most important skill for a project manager or leader to hold. It is important to keep in mind that your gain is often going to be someone else's loss within the organization or outside the organization. So negotiate wisely and strive to negotiate win-win situations as much as possible. In highly matrixed organizations, this is especially true, as the majority, if not all of your project team, will not report directly to the project manager. When faced with a tough negotiation, consider the following guidelines. Maintaining high aspirations will lead to a more successful negotiation. Do not reveal your initial position. Think about concessions before you make them. Ask questions to find out more about the other side's position. Be discreet and only reveal the information necessary at the time. Check to see that there is proof behind any assumptions being made. Take your time. Quick settlements aren't always the best ones. Develop a plan beforehand to improve performance during a negotiation. Stick to the plan and stay focused throughout the entire process. Use power play sparingly or retaliation could result. Know when to walk away and say, no deal. The develop project team phase refers to the early stage planning process in which the fundamental core of the project team is put in place, but it is also important to consider throughout the project as the project is executed by the team and progress is monitored and controlled. These individuals make up the project team and the maximization of their performance is essential to the proper functioning of the project process and the ultimate successful completion of the project as well as the successful completion of all of the individual components within. The process of developing the project team refers to the specific activity of enhancing the performance of each individual member of the project team as well as the overall performance of the team as a whole by improving the individual competencies of the team as well as enhancing the communication and interactions among the team members. Essential to the entire life of the project and imperative to its ultimate success is effective and reliable communication. Examples of team development helping the clinical staff understand the technical side of the project and helping the technical personnel to understand the clinical need that the project will be filling. Taking the clinical or technical personnel on a tour of each other's areas and explaining some of the equipment used is a great learning experience for both sides. A strong and effective team will increase the ability of each stakeholder or project participant to contribute to the overall project. This will directly lead to an increased ability of the team to function well as a team. Team building activities can be as simple as weekly team meetings, a regular social event, or more structured activities such as mock problem solving. Good team chemistry is essential to a highly functional team. Team members must obtain a high level of trust and interdependency, as well as the ability to resolve conflicts in a positive manner. Be sure to balance out everyone's strengths and weaknesses. If you feel that you are top-heavy in a particular skill level or knowledge base, seek out personnel that compensates and balances the group. Having all clinical staff on a health IT project would never work just as having all technical or administrative staff on a clinical project would never work. So what makes up effective project teams? Effective project teams can be described by the following characteristics. First, they support and trust each other. The team has clear objectives. They are on the same page and heading in the same direction. Based on their trust, they are open to cooperation and conflict. They help each other but are not afraid to disagree and positively resolve conflicts in order to achieve a better result. The team has effective processes and procedures in place. These are often documented in a project chart. They help avoid conflict, improve communications, and depersonalize decision-making. 
Solid leadership helps keep team morale high, provides a clear vision, and supports the team in achieving individual and team goals. Attention is given to individual development, whether through stretch assignments or formal training opportunities. The group has a good understanding of its position within the organization and establishes good relationships with other groups to facilitate collaboration and the achievement of both project and organizational goals. The project manager plays a variety of leadership roles in a successful project. As a mediator, the project manager facilitates resolution of conflict in a positive way that increases trust and improves the project and the team. As a mentor, the project manager helps the individual members of the project team learn and grow. As a cheerleader, the project manager provides positive feedback and encouragement at all phases of the project, recognizing the team and individuals. As a trainer, the project manager passes on knowledge and skills that are required to complete the project. As a gopher, the project manager does whatever is required to maximize the productivity and morale of their team. The project manager must be ready to take on any role in order to ensure success. As a coach, the project manager urges and encourages their team to push themselves to new levels of productivity and creativity. As a job counselor, the project manager consults with their team about what is next after this project, where can team members aspire to, and what do they need to do to get there. The project manager is like being the parent to a group of highly developed teenagers. You have to use all your considerable skills to move the project along. Forming, storming, norming, performing is a model of group development first proposed by Bruce Tuckman in 1965. He maintained that these phases are all necessary and inevitable in order for a team to grow, tackle challenges, address problems, find solutions, plan work, and deliver results. His model has become the basis for various subsequent models. Teams typically progress through stages as indicated in the slide. Forming. During this stage, the behavior of the team is largely driven by a desire for acceptance. Conflict is avoided. Routines and organization are the focus. Individuals are becoming aware of each other and the team. A project manager will focus on telling the members of the team what they should do and how they should do it. Storming. During this stage, different ideas begin to compete, and the team often struggles to find its goals and purpose collectively. Conflict is the key characteristic of the storming phase. A project manager will remain directive, but must also sell the project goals, team roles, and key approaches in order to normalize the project team. Norming. During this stage, the team has one goal and a mutual plan for the team. Team members begin to take responsibility and develop ambition to work towards the goals of the team. During this phase, a project manager will typically be a project participant and will facilitate getting things done. Performing. Some high-performing teams reach the perform stage. These teams are largely self-managed and each member can work autonomously with the project manager primarily acting as the delegator of work. Conflict is inevitable. The most common causes of conflicts in projects are schedules, project priorities, resources, technical opinions. There are several common methods for resolving conflict. The first is collaboration. Collaboration operates when participants share the workload to achieve the group's goals. Open discussion leads to cooperation, negotiation, and creative solutions to each participant's problems. This approach requires a high level of trust it can also be very useful when you don't want to have full responsibility for a decision and you want others to also have ownership of solutions. It is especially effective when the people involved are willing to change their thinking as more information is found and new options are suggested. Collaborating can be challenging when you need to work through animosity and hard feelings. The collaboration process takes lots of time and energy. In some cases, you will encounter people who may take advantage of other people's trust and openness. The second method to resolve conflict is compromise. 
participants compromise by resolving their issues through mutual concessions. That is, each participant concedes a small point to achieve a greater good for the group. It is possible, but can also be challenging when people of equal status are equally committed to goals. Compromise can be a useful, efficient technique if you apply it to small or medium-sized issues within the major conflict rather than the broad issue under contention. Holding out for large concessions can create frustration, ill will, and rancor, and ultimately end negotiations. This resolution can spawn cynicism, especially if there's no commitment to honor the compromise solutions. The process of accommodation focuses on a shared goal that outranks participants' smaller individual goals. By prioritizing the relationship over separate needs, accommodation relieves conflict. It can also be used when an issue is not as important to you as it is to the other person. Or you may choose to use it when you understand that your position is not sound or currently viable, or to engender goodwill among the other participants. Accommodating can also be used when harmony is extremely important or when the parties in common something that is more important than their differences. Drawbacks of accommodation can be that your own ideas don't get attention or that your credibility and influence can be lost. Competition implies a winner and a loser in the conflict. When the stakes are high, the pressure is mounting, and time is of the essence. The need to win can be a critical motivator for a participant. Use caution, however, as competing can escalate conflict and losers may retaliate in some way. Finally, you may decide to use avoidance strategies, such as retreating, circumventing, or delaying an issue if the current time or place is not appropriate for resolving the conflict directly. Avoidance may be your best option when you feel that the issue is not critical. The relationships are more important than the outcome. Tempers are rising. Other problems need to be addressed. Losing is inevitable. You are emotionally invested in the outcome. Others are better to fight this battle. Or you simply need more information to argue your side of the issue. It is important to understand that postponing conflict sometimes can make matters worse. Have you ever considered a conflict in your work or personal life and effectively resolved it? Which of the techniques described in the last slide did you use? Make a list of these techniques. Ground rules will provide clear protocols for behavior and project work. They also often provide a set of processes for how to deal with behavior outside of the defined ground rules. Ground rules are typically defined in the project charter and are based on existing organizational process and policy. Ground rules for projects should be established early on via the project charter. Throughout the project, the charter should be updated as necessary to keep protocols appropriate for the team and the project. These must be agreed upon and bought into by all team members. When a project team is assembled in preparation for a project to get underway, it is absolutely essential to determine up front the person who will be responsible for managing the project team. It is essential also to have a single voice to speak for and represent the team's ideas. This person will also control and harness the activities of the team. This improves productivity and cohesion of team process. Specifically, the concept of Manage Project Team refers to the project management process that involves the tracking of the performance of each individual team member. It also includes providing any necessary feedback in regards to that performance and resolving any issues that may have arisen in the process to date. In addition, managing the project team requires coordinating and implementing any changes that may need to take place in order to enhance the performance of the project team from the current point forward. A project manager must be both manager and leader. Modern project management is not just about completing projects on time and on budget. It is also important to make sure that a team feels good about the result and each other at the end of the project. As a manager, a project manager must produce consistent results, including the planning, organizing, executing, and controlling operations of the project. As a leader, a project manager must lead at all levels, establishing a vision and strategy at the project and organizational level.
The project manager must also be a positive motivating force for the team. There are several distinct management styles. This slide provides an overview of each style. An autocratic style means that the manager makes decisions unilaterally and without much regard for subordinates. As a result, decisions will reflect the opinions and personality of the manager. This in turn can project an image of a confident, well-managed business. On the other hand, subordinates may become overly dependent upon the leaders and more supervision may be needed. In a democratic style, the manager allows the employees to take part in decision-making, therefore everything is agreed upon by the majority. The communication is extensive in both directions, from subordinates to leaders and vice versa. This style can be particularly useful when complex decisions need to be made that require a range of specialist skills. In a laissez-faire leadership style, the leadership's role is peripheral and staff manages their own areas of the business. The leader therefore evades the duties of management and uncoordinated delegation occurs. The communication in this style is horizontal, meaning that it is equal in both directions. However, very little communication occurs in comparison with the other styles. The style brings out the best in highly professional and creative groups of employees. However, in many cases, it is not deliberate and is simply a result of poor management. This concludes Lecture B of Team Management and Communications. In summary, this lecture focused on several organizational behavior theories. The lecture also focused on different management styles, including autocratic, democratic, and laissez-faire.